Okay, hello my friends. My name is Darren Gertis. Here are the updates for today. This is the daily brief. I do this every day. Today is Wednesday, July 24th. 1140 Russians off the battlefield, 14 tanks, 13 uh, armored combat vehicles, 65 artillery pieces, 77 vehicles and fuel tanks. Now when I look at this number, it tells me two things. It tells me how hot the battlefield is over the course of the day, like if the number is elevated or if the number is lowered. But I'm also trying to calculate mentally like how many Ukrainians are off the battlefield simultaneously and we just don't know that but we know that it's some kind of fraction um, maybe it's one to one maybe it's two to one three to one something or one to three something like that so let's say it's uh, half right that's still 500 600 or so Ukrainians off the battlefield and Ukrainians are um, in a war of attrition where they're outnumbered three to one roughly speaking just by raw population totals and so the, the higher this goes the more people tend to cheer and the more i tend to cringe because i know that uh, there's going to be there's hot, some hot fighting right now and this is a difficult place to be for the ukrainians okay these numbers look absolutely fantastic this is yes last night about well, i don't know about 11 hours ago andrew perpetual put out his list uh i haven't seen a new, new one today but this is what six to one russian to uh ukrainian losses maybe maybe a little bit more i i, I didn't count exactly but wow that that's something good to see Six people injured due to another missile attack in Kharkiv, according to the Kharkiv mayor. Uh, this is the fifth strike. Andrew, uh, or Anton Yaroshenko is talking about the fifth strike in Kharkiv just today was confirmed by the city's mayor. It targeted an industrial zone. Information about the damage is being clarified. Preliminarily, there were no casualties. The videos, and I'm not really showing the videos, showed the aftermath of the Russian attack. Uh, yeah, it just, the hits keep coming. Okay, Sersky was interviewed, General Sersky, um, in The Guardian, and here are the highlights from his interview. Russian losses are three times higher than Ukrainian losses. When it comes to military, so let's say that we're talking about uh, three to one, right? Okay, so 1140 or rough, let's say roughly 12 will round up. That means 400 Ukrainians are off the battlefield as well, and that's not a great thing. So three to one. When it comes to military equipment, the ratio here is one to two or one to three in favor of the Russians. Okay, in favor of the Russians means that the the higher number is uh, the Russian number, is, I, as I understand what he's saying. And and that would be verified by Andrew Perpetua's list regularly. It's, it is higher losses for Russian equipment. It's important for us to preserve life, uh, the lives of, the, of our fighters, not to protect ruins. So he's hinting at we're going to be losing some land, but we'll be retaining our people. And that's that's a positive thing. That's what he has to do because he is outmanned. Ukrainian drones hit about 200, 000, or 200 critical infrastructure facilities in Russia. We're talking about oil depots and things along those lines. The F-16 deliveries to Ukraine. Fighters will approach the front no closer than 40 kilometers to avoid being shot down. So they can come up, shoot their missiles, and then fly away before they can get tagged. And that's what they need to do. They need to survive. Russia had 100,000 soldiers at the beginning of the invasion. Now the number has grown to 520,000. By the end of 2024, it will be 690,000. That's some perspective right? And Ukraine's key objective is the destruction of the Crimean Bridge. When they do that, they start to really choke off Crimea in a significant and meaningful way. And that's coming. Okay, Jason J. Smart, the Ukrainian crew of a container ship in the Red Sea, destroyed Houthi naval drones with the help of small arms. Wow. Okay, so these are Ukrainians who have actually shot this down. Uh, and there's a some kind of uh, naval drone about to attack this and <laughs> just with rifles and whatever, they shot it and destroyed it. Remember, the Houthis just destroyed a Russian vessel as well in the Red Sea. So this is no small feat that they were able yeah. to accomplish that. Okay. Uh, NATO is negotiating to bring nuclear weapons to combat readiness and increase their deployment due to growing threats from Russia and China, according to Jen Stoltenberg. He said that NATO needs to showcase its nuclear arsenal to send a direct signal. 
Nothing's going to come of that. They're, this isn't going to turn into a world war or something along these lines. In fact, we're just we're just not doing anything about well about anything. So if we look at this, here is a report: Russia hits NATO member Romania with kamikaze drone. Okay, a kamikaze drone on Wednesday flew into NATO airspace and detonated near a Romanian village. Ukrainian news report said, but a fish, a Bucharest said that the strike wasn't confirmed and that they would check. But nothing will happen about this. Remember that we'll defend every single inch? No, they won't. No, because they're, they're worried about um, escalating the war and they're just not going to do that. They're just not prepared for that. And so it's a false promise and we're deterred by Russia and Russia is not deterred by the West. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz confirmed that Germany will not change its stance on oil strikes deep into Russia amid uh, aiming to avoid direct confrontation with Russia. He emphasized, are you seeing the trend here? Like that's what's actually happening. Nothing's going to change. And, and he said this, he emphasized the decisions are made carefully to prevent the Russia-Ukraine war from escalating into a Russia-NATO war. The best way to escalate it is to do absolutely nothing about something like what just happened in Romania. Like, like there should be a clear message to the Russians. If something comes into our territory, now we're going to allow our uh, artillery to shoot down things that are coming into Ukraine or whatever it is. But to do nothing is the worst case scenario in my estimation. EU ambassadors have agreed, this is positive, on the allocation of 4.2 billion euros of budgetary aid from the EU to Ukraine. The EU Council will soon approve the tranche. And I'm not sure exactly all the steps, but it's moving the right direction. There was a car blown up in Moscow. I didn't think much of it. It's the deputy chief of the transmitting radio center uh, of a satellite communications military unit and his wife were blown up in a car in Moscow. They were hospitalized with serious injuries. Kaliba, meantime, I talked about this last night, he's in China. I don't know if anything will come of it, but he's working on having the Chinese work out some kind of peace negotiations tentatively. Uh, again, we don't know what will come of it. Kiev has opened a negotiation with Russia if Moscow is ready to do so in good faith, but Russia's not ready to do so in good faith, so it'll probably amount to nothing. But it does look good politically to say, see, we're trying. Anton Gurishenko, Russia has passed a bill that concerns restrictions of the use of civilian gadgets at the front. Head of State Duma Defense Committee said the bill was passed very quickly. And why so? So that Russian soldiers and war correspondents don't send demoralizing videos from the front and complain. So that Russian commanders make money off the soldiers' call to home. So that Russian soldiers won't read the news. Like, what's what's going on here? But... In, in good faith, I have to say, okay, I understand the other side as well. Somebody posted this. The U.S. doesn't allow this either. Okay, so fairsy, fairsy. We got to say, yeah, it's probably not a good idea to let them have that at the front for practical reasons, not just those reasons. I talked about this last night and the day before in the Three Big Stories segment. Hungary is to block EU funds for member states until Ukraine allows Luke Oil transit. And then you see this also with Slovakia is threatening to respond to Ukraine's actions regarding the cessation of oil transit from the Russian company Luke Oil through the Drzova pipeline. Uh, it, this was stated by Slovak President Peter Pellegrini. Uh, we talked about Fico saying it. See, I pronounced it right. Thank you for correcting me again. Uh, and we talked about that um, Yes, the day before yesterday, and then we talked about the Slovaks yesterday. Uh, no, we talked about the Slovaks the first day, and then Hungary the second day. Uh, and it's noted that Pellegrini and the other uh, country's defense minister uh, sharply criticized Ukraine for refusing to supply Russian oil. Well, this Russian oil is flowing through Ukraine to Slovakia and Hungary, and they're still getting it, and they're happy to get it. And now they're going to have to figure out another way to get their oil, and they're upset. And that it's still going through that pipeline is already uh, amazingly bad. Okay, so they, it was just sanctioned and now it's not going to flow and they're upset. Boy tells his mother after being released from captivity. And here we're talking about a boy, but we're talking about like a soldier being released from captivity, I believe. We didn't believe in the exchange until the very end because they deceive us so much. They torment us. They would take us for execution and exchanges and they would bring us back and laugh at us. And when a soldier came to the bus and said, you're home, boys, 
glory to Ukraine, a Ukrainian soldier. I, I just started breathing. I hadn't been breathing. Mom, really. And when we saw people along the road greeting us with flags and flowers and signs, it felt like a movie. I forgot your number, Mom. Can you imagine it? But you're not mad because how could I forget your number? I repeated it to myself for two years. And at the hospital, they gave us clothes and took us to the dining room. And there was food, Mom. There were three bowls of different things for each of us. I don't know. I didn't eat that much in captivity in a month. And the smell of soup, my head started spinning. The bowl was so deep. The soup was up to the brim. I was so careful with the spoon, trying not to spill anything. But my hands were shaking, Mom, because I wanted to eat properly, but I, I also wanted to just grab the bowl and drink it all. A lady walked around, refilling everything for her. She came up to me, hugged me, stroked my head like Grandma used to, kissed me on the temple. Eat, dear. I'll bring more, she said. And that's when I cried. I ate and I cried, afraid to look up because I felt ashamed. And then I looked around and almost all of us were like that, eating and crying. And the soup, Mom, I never had tasted any, had anything tastier in my life. That's the experience of the soldier, the POW coming back. And it's not just POWs, there are children that are in, that are occupied or being taken into occupied territory. Chechens have decided to engage in re-education of Ukrainian children. And it's far more than this. I'm going to do another video in a couple of days about this because it's, it's, it's awful. Children from the occupied territories are taken to a camp in Luhansk, financed by the Katerov Foundation. They're, they're dressed up in military uniforms and forced to shout al Akbar. and I'm sure there's plenty of other re-education happening to these children. Last little bit, I'm going to show you an inscription on the poster, Special Military Operation Hero, Nikita Sablin, lived in this house. He died a brave death and was awarded the Order of Courage posthumously. I, I guess they're thinking that this is going to motivate people to join the military i i guess all right that's all that i have thank you for your time thank you for the likes and the shares and the subscribes and thank you most of all for being the kind of person that cares about ukraine